previous lesson we got to know how the British rule impacted the lives of the tribals because the British rule had infringed upon their territories. The tribal chiefs were losing their power and autonomy. Now the tribals were in no way willing to surrender all their power, all their lands and regions to the British rule, which is why we learned that they were breaking out in rebellions. Now whenever we talk about rebellions that took place from the ends of the tribals against the British colonial rule, mention must be made of one particular rebellion. Now when we talk about this certain rebellion, we will get to know about the leader that spearheaded it. This leader was undaunted by the oppression that was meted out by the Britishers. He did not flinch. He was very brave and he was very courageous. So aren't you very curious to know which leader I am referring to in this regard? Let us now find out who this great tribal leader was and the tribal rebellion that he spearheaded. The tribal leader that we need to talk about in this regard is Bishamunda. Now Bishamunda was a very courageous and dauntless tribal chief. Which tribe did he belong to? His very name suggests that he belonged to the Munda clan. Now the Munda clan was most concentrated in the region that comprises the present day Indian state of Jharkhand. You can locate Jharkhand in this present day map of India. Now he was very brave and he fought against the British because he was a tribal chief who believed in his autonomy, in the autonomy of his clan. Let us now find out about the early life of Bishamunda and how that played a significant role in making him a dauntless and fearless tribal chief. Bishamunda was born to a poor family in the 1870s. He and his father had to struggle a lot in order to earn a living. Now his father told him lots of stories about the golden age of the Mundas when they were not exploited by the Britishers, when they lived happy and independent lives. Now when Birsha went to a Christian missionary school, he got to know about a lot of things that alcohol consumption, witchcraft and living the villages dirty are bad practices and he needed to discard those. So we learnt about the early life of Bishamunda. Now he knew that they had to do something in order to gain independence from the Britishers. Now Bisha started a revolutionary movement. Why did he do so? Because he hoped that he would be able to put an end to the violations to the Munda sufferings that were inflicted by the British colonial rule as well as the landlords as well as the money lenders who used to exploit these vulnerable tribal people. Now what did Bisha think of? Firstly he thought of the time when the Mundas were very united, when the Mundas were not pitted against each other, when they were not killing each other. Now from this he learned that the Mundas need to be united and it is in unity that they would be able to fight back the Britishers from their territory. Now what did Bisha do when he began this revolutionary movement? Let us now find out about the revolutionary movement that was started under the leadership and guidance of Bisha Munda. Now Bisha Munda was very popular in the Munda clan. Firstly the people of this clan believed that Bisha had magical powers. He would be the one who would be able to bring them autonomy and independence from the Dikus which included the money lenders, the Britishers and at the same time they believed that with his magical powers he can heal them. He can restore them their original peace and autonomy. Now Bisha Munda declared that God had appointed him. So he believed that he was a divinely appointed person who was there to bring independence to the Munda clan. Who would give the Mundas freedom from working and serving as slaves to the Dikus. 
So let us now find out what he did in this attempt to gain freedom and autonomy. With this began the Munda rebellion. It began in the latter half of the 19th century. Now this started under the leadership of Bisha Munda as you must have understood by now. And he was very powerful. Firstly, he went face to face against the Britishers. Now the Britishers on the other hand were not willing to surrender their power to these tribals. We have learned that these Britishers had come to colonize the country and at the same time they tried to uproot the tribals from the forests and take control over their regions, over their lives as a whole. So what did the Britishers do? They immediately decided to arrest Bishamunda, which is why in the year 1895 Bisha was arrested. But due to the growing popularity of the Munda rebellion, the Britishers were then compelled to leave and send him out of prison after two years. What happened then? As in what happened when Bishamunda was released from the prison? Now all the Munda people now started gathering. They were mobilizing and they realized that they would have to act together. Together they needed to fight back the Britishers, which is why they now started attacking police stations and churches that belonged to the Britishers. But the Britishers were not the only people who were considered as the outsiders or dikus by these tribals or the Munda clan to be specific in this regard. Because there were other Hindu landlords, there were many moneylenders who also exploited these illiterate and vulnerable tribal people. So along with attacking and burning down the police stations and churches that belonged to the British government, these tribals also attacked and plundered the property of the moneylenders and the zamindars because they were very determined at this point of time to fight back and throw away all these dikus from their own land. But what was the repercussion of this? As in, do you think this Munda rebellion was very successful in throwing out all these moneylenders, these landlords, along with the Britishers from their own lands that were situated in the present day Indian state of Jharkhand? Well, let us now find that out. While the Munda rebellion was ongoing and these people were fighting against the Britishers and the moneylenders, they remained united. And after being very united and after mobilizing the masses, they also needed to show an emblem of themselves. They also needed to prove their unity. What did they do? Now, the Mundas put forward the white flag. What did this white flag symbolize you might question? Well, this white flag was an emblem of Bisharaj. So you can understand how the Mundas under the leadership of Bisha Munda were trying to throw away the British rule from their region and they wanted to establish the Munda autonomy. They wanted to establish something known as the Bisharaj. But as fate would have it, the Munda rebellion did not last for a long period of time. Now in this powerful and dauntless tribal chief that was Bisha Munda, the Britishers saw fear. They were afraid of him. They thought that this tribal chief had the power to overthrow their rule, which is why they kept on imprisoning him multiple times. And it was in the year 1900 that Bisha passed away in the prison itself. So, 9th of June 1900 marked the death of Bisha Munda as well as the official termination or end of the Munda rebellion. So, from this you can understand that the Munda rebellion did not last for a long period of time. It came into being by the end of the 19th century and it was only in 1900 when this rebellion came to an end. 
Though this Munda rebellion did not last for a long period of time and did not achieve great success in bringing the Mundas their autonomy, independence and freedom, it had far-reaching impacts. It is now imperative on our part to understand what the impacts of this Munda rebellion were. But before finding out the impacts of the Munda rebellion, let me ask you a question. When did Bisha Munda die? Did he die on the 9th of June 1900, the 15th of July 1900, the 23rd of October 1900 or on the 4th of September 1900? Well, the correct answer is the 9th of June 1900. This date along with marking the death of Bisha Munda also marked the end or the termination of the Munda rebellion. Let us now find out the impacts that this rebellion had left in the politics of the subcontinent. Firstly, the Britishers now realized what the tribals were capable of. Earlier on, the Britishers considered the tribals wild and savage who lived in the forests, who needed to be tamed and civilized. But after this Munda rebellion, the Britishers realized that they were a force to reckon with. They could go to any extent to fight for their freedom, to fight for their independence. They were not having it easy and they were not letting go of their lands very easily. Which is why the British government was now compelled to pass certain laws. Let us now find out to what end these laws were passed. Firstly, these laws forbid the transfer of tribal lands to non-tribals. We have learned that when the dikus, as in the moneylenders or the landlords had reached the forested regions, they were trying to encroach upon the territories that belonged to the tribals. They wanted to bring under their control the territories which were originally of the tribals. But now this certain law that the Britishers passed was supposed to forbid or prohibit the transfer of tribal lands to non-tribal people. So the non-tribal people as in people who lived in mainstream societies could no longer encroach upon or bring under their control the lands that belonged to the tribals. So let us now find out about one such act that prohibited the transfer of tribal lands to non-tribal people. Well, the Chota Nagpur Tenancy Act that was introduced by the British government in the year 1908 was one such act. And the passing of this act as you can understand was directly influenced by the Munda Rebellion. Because it is only subsequent to the Munda Rebellion that acts like the Chota Nagpur Tenancy Act and many other were passed. And now the Munda rebellion had a very important impact in a different kind of way. What was that? Well, the Munda rebellion clearly established the courage and the power of the tribals. Well, the tribals have been the ones who have always lived on the fringes or on the peripheries of the mainstream societies. They have never gained massive social recognition. They were not even considered proper civilized human beings by the Britishers. But after these rebellions broke out like the Munda rebellion, the Bastar rebellion, the Coal rebellion or the Worldly rebellion, the Britishers along with the mainstream societies now realized that these people were very powerful. They were very brave and courageous. They were dauntless because they were not afraid of fighting for their own land even if it costed their own lives. And so the Munda rebellion has been a very important point in the pages of history. And it is this rebellion that had subsequently inspired many other clans to fight for their own independence from the British colonial rule as well as from the moneylenders and the landlords who exploited them. This brings us to an end of our discussion on tribals, dikus and the vision of a golden age. 
well in this series of lessons we have been introduced to the way of living of the tribals now here we learnt firstly that the tribals lived on the fringes of the societies they did not enter the mainstream societies more often than not now they were mostly living the lives of hunter gatherers they were very self sufficient they could eat whatever they grew but as the societies kept evolving many of these tribes were also caught in the process of evolution and in this process of evolution their food habits also evolved they began to eat food grains like rice and other crops which is why they now started depending on the mainstream societies to procure these food crops but the mainstream societies did not let them be because they encroached upon their territories the mainstream societies wanted to bring the tribals as well as their lands under their control this now brought us to a discussion on the dikus the dikus were the outsiders and they comprised the britishers the money lenders as well as the landlords now the tribals were very hostile to these dikus and it is very justifiably so they did not want their autonomy and their independence to be taken away which is why they were revolting they fiercely rebelled for their freedom and this led to many tribal rebellions in different parts of the indian subcontinent subsequently we went on to discussing the life and the achievements of bishamunda well our discussion on tribal rebellions shall have remained incomplete without a mention of this great and this dauntless tribal chief we have also learnt about the munda rebellion and the long lasting impacts it had both on other mainstream societies and the long lasting impacts it had on the british colonial rule as well as on the mainstream societies so with this we conclude our discussion on tribals dikus and the vision of a golden age don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon you can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the delta step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus master each topic with our adaptive practice technology get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests get all your doubts resolved instantly learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and ipads so at delta step learning is not just fun and easy it's rewarding too so register for free now